Hello, this is Ed Rigsby. Welcome to Raw and Unedited, the place where association executives like you come for innovation, insight, solutions, all to make you a more effective leader. Have you ever wondered? It seems like the system is just rigged. Well, if you've ever wondered that, I have Joel Block, CPAE, CSP, Whoops, I kind of blew it right, right from the beginning, but this is raw and unedited uh, CPA. He's, uh, right, right. He's, got, he's got a hell of a lot more personality than any CPA I've ever met. Anyway, <laughs> let's move on from that. Uh, CPA, uh, CSP, Certified Speaking Professional, and the author of this awesome book, Stop Hustling Gigs. And um, it, 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 I, I think that, the really cool thing with Joe, before I let him, you know, before we get into the first question, is because of the fact that he's been the chairman uh, for uh, the Boys and Girls Club in Los Angeles, which is a pretty good sized club. So he's, he's been there from the volunteer leader side. He advises corporations uh, across the country on not only the finance, but the business side. So, so he's your business guy's business guy. So Joel, let's, let's talk about in your book, yes. uh, suggestion number 40, you say, rig the rules. Well, if, 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 if the system's rigged, how do you rig the rules? <laughs> hey, first of all, Ed, thanks uh, very much. This is, um, this is fun. You're, uh, you've got a lot of personality, and, and, and I'm sure we're going to have a lot of fun here together. So listen, uh, the bottom line is uh, we all know that the system is rigged. And rigged doesn't mean illegal, by the way. Rigged just means that uh, tilted in somebody's favor. Mm -hmm. uh, everything is tilted in somebody's favor. Everybody's trying to tilt the rules in somebody's favor. Unfortunately, most of the time, it's not tilted in our favor. And that's the thing that uh, bothers most of us. Is we all know it's, uh, it's tilted and rigged. We just don't know how to, how to make it happen. And, and the way it happens is through the implementation of business rules. And the best, thing I can, uh, the best example I can give you is that uh, in Las Vegas, uh, all, the, all the rules of all the table games and all the slot machine games, and everything, it's, it's absolutely rigged in the favor of Las Vegas. In sure. fact, it's so obvious that they're rigged in the favor of Las Vegas. We don't even call it rigged. Uh, we, we call it the house advantage. It's just so normal that we just call it the house advantage. So now what you want to do is when you're producing the rules for your own organization, whether it's a business, an association, whatever it is, uh, you want to put the, uh, the rules in your own favor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of the things that I tell smaller companies is, uh, you know, listen, you're, you're, uh, you may be hungry for some money and you just say to a company, hey, listen, uh, whatever uh, the rules are, uh, fine, I'll, I'll take it. Well, that's, that's a, a pretty much a guarantee for going out of business pretty fast. Uh, you know, a, a better rule would be, hey, listen, we want our payment in 30 days. Uh, we give uh, a discount if you pay us in 10. We want prepayment. Uh, whatever the rules are, you make the rules, and then the customer can say yes or no. Sure. If the rules are, are not good rules, then they're going to say no. And if they're good rules, then they'll say yes, and you're going to be a successful business. Uh, there are other companies that have rules that are so egregious that the federal government has to step in. The way that banks clear checks, uh, the government had to step in and reorganize that because it was just so unfair. It was causing so many uh, overdrafts and NSF charges to bank to uh, customers. So uh, you really have to be careful. And the last point about this is, uh, and this is one of the ones that are that companies are calling me all the time about, is, hey, listen, we want to write the rules. Uh, that's great. Little companies need to learn how to write rules. But what big companies need to do, they say, well, Joel, we already have rules. But do you have good rules? Mm. Are the rules that you have fair rules? Sure. Because let me promise you, uh, 20 years ago, if the rules were unfair, mm -hmm. uh, they would just be unfair and that'd be it. Look at the cable companies, the airlines, the, these giant companies, they'd give terrible service. Now what happens? Well, now when the service is terrible, consumers go on Twitter, uh, they go on Facebook, they start sure. publishing things, they take pictures, the pictures go viral, it gets picked up by the, uh, by the traditional media. It goes everywhere, and then these companies are embarrassed, and the consumers end up getting their way. So uh, consumers, even a single consumer, has a lot of power that they didn't have before. So big companies need to reevaluate their business rules and make sure that they're not egregious and one-sided. So you know, there's, there's a little balance here.
how can trade associations, especially um, a trade association or professional society, the uh, whatever the chief staff executive is, whether it's a, the title is chair, president, uh, executive director, CEO, whatever, how, how does this person um, look at their rules, their organization's rules, and overlay with what you just talked about with the ability for social media for people to get out there and make noise and, and make sure that their rules are fair? Well, first of all, you know, inside of an organization, uh, the whole world might not care, but the people inside the organization might care. So the, the sphere of people that they're talking to is much smaller, which actually is more powerful. Mm. Uh, it's, it's much easier for a member of an organization to talk to all the other people in the organization and get in touch with those people. So you really have to make sure that you're, uh, that you're being fair, that you're, that you're being fair to your company. In other words, that things are working your way. Mm -hmm. You've rigged the rules in a way that is good to you guys, but not so rigged that the whole world gets upset and, and calls you unfair. So let's take, for example, uh, membership fees, uh, the way the dues get paid, whether they're automatic credit card. If you don't have these things written down, uh, if people don't know in advance what the rules are, if they're not familiar or comfortable, and if you surprise people with things, those are not good practices. They're not good policies. People just need to know what to expect. And if they know what to expect, then the likelihood of having conflict um, goes away. I mean, take a look. I mean, I mean, you're going to have conflict with people anyway. Why make extra conflict by being silly and being uh, less than professional sure. by writing the things down and letting people know what it is that they need to know? So a little transparency goes a long way. A long way. Sure it Very does. Good. So, you know, when you talk about rigging the rules, um, there's a trend out there in the uh, association world where uh, association executives are being bombarded with articles from, and really I hate to say it, but you know, it, it's maybe it's uh, um, uh, accounting uh, companies or accounting consultancies, this, that, and the other, on trying to convince, and, and, and you know, I don't know whether it's good or bad, but trying to convince um, the chief staff executives of the associations and societies, well, you know, you'd probably be better off to outsource your accounting, or you'd be better off to outsource your audit, or you'd be better off to outsource various um, uh, various activities. And, and when I overlay that within your book, number 41, tip number 41 says, I'm going to read this here, don't let attor attorneys kill the deals, okay? <laughs> and then number 42, use CPAs, but don't expect magic. So I'm kind of getting from you that, Okay, these people have expertise, and I'm I'm wondering, you know, can an association um, get into trouble by relying too much on outside expertise and not having inside, or is, could it be vice versa? What, you know, what's, your, what's your take on that? Yeah, that this is uh, they're two different things, uh, and let's talk about attorneys first. Uh, every organization in America needs attorneys because we're a we're a society of laws, we're a country of laws, and uh, you need attorneys to help you. There are all there are labor labor laws. There are uh, tax laws. I mean, there's all kind of laws that we need to abide by, and you need the guidance from attorneys. But attorneys give legal advice; they don't give business advice. And it's very important for executive directors to understand the difference between business mm -hmm. advice and legal advice. Okay. So if attorney uh, gives you legal advice, uh, that's great. You should probably take that legal advice. Uh, you know, you should. Take it in, you know, listen, large organizations are going to have an inside attorney. They may give uh, legal advice. Uh, they may give some business advice because they're intimately familiar with the business. But they'll also probably have outside attorneys who are specialists in different kinds of uh, situations. And you have to be very careful to know when an attorney is crossing the line between giving business advice and legal advice. And most attorneys are pretty good at this. I mean, they really do know where their box is. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, listen, I'm an attorney. I give legal advice. I can't tell you how to run your business. And you have to know when to make decisions. So for example, uh, how do you raise the dues? An attorney can help you to you know, make sure you don't go outside the rules of your bylaws or whatever. But how much the number is, that might be a business decision and you have to make that decision. And the sure. attorney probably wouldn't comment on it, although a lot of them you know, step, overstep their bounds and they do. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times they're not sensitive to the needs of the constituency. So the board of directors, the executive director and the others, who are familiar and comfortable and, and intimate with the, uh, with the constituency, they have to make the business decisions and they have to do it inside the, the confines of the law, which has helped, you know, we, you know, we get that guidance from our attorneys. So that's what that means is really attorneys kill deals because sometimes 
uh, they over advocate for us. Sometimes uh, they, they go so far out of their way to help us that they really hurt us. And you have to be very careful uh, that they don't, they don't make you an organization that is so impossible to work with that nobody can work with you. And that's just, you know, that's just a personal preference. On the topic of CPAs, uh, I think a lot of people think that their CPA is, uh, you know, is a magician. And CPAs are not magicians. We all have the same tax law, every one of us. There's one tax law sure. uh, federally in the United States for income tax purposes. There's a whole bunch of different taxes, by the way. And, and then there's every state. These things are terribly complex. And uh, now that we have a brand new uh, overhaul to the tax system in the last couple of months, uh, it becomes even more complex because now CPAs have to know everything that starts in 2018. They have to know every rule from before 2018. And so there's just all this stuff, which by the way means that their fees are going to be going higher because they oh. become more necessary and they have to spend more time uh, off the clock studying these things, which mm -hmm. means their rates have to go higher. So um, don't expect magic. I mean, you know, we're all subject to the same tax law. Uh, not not for profits have a, a special kind of arrangement, uh, so the whole tax system is really more designed for the for profits. But you want to be very careful uh, not to be doing things that you shouldn't do to jeopardize your not for profit status and so forth. So, and do you have a what are your thoughts as far as um, with a let's say a you know a mid sized association that's got a you know a ten million dollar budget. Um, would they be better off having a CPA on staff or would they be better off uh, outsourcing uh, that kind of stuff to a, a firm? Well, first of all, the, the IRS gives guidance about this and, and they say that uh, over $3 million is it's considered sophisticated. And so if you're a larger organization, then, okay. then you need to have a more sophisticated operation. Oh, okay. And, and so uh, if you're very small, listen, QuickBooks is probably okay. And, uh, you know, you just go about your business. But if you're a larger organization, three million and above, then you really need to have better, uh, better record keeping. You need to have some number of people inside, whether they're bookkeepers, uh, controllers, uh, you know, a CFO. If you're a larger organization, somebody needs to really keep their eye on all the things that are happening inside the organization. And then you would outsource. Of course, you hire an auditor to come in and, and produce your uh, probably probably produce your 990 and give your audit report. So. Uh, you know, you can outsource some parts. If you have a lot of data entry, for example, you might outsource that to uh, another company who would do the data entry. They might do uh, certain kinds of management of uh, your receivables or some of your, your money that's moving around. But, you know, uh, you need to have some of that happening inside. Somebody needs to be responsible at your organization for the money. And if you're going to have uh, different kinds of people involved in different things, then you need to have really good internal controls. And accounting firms are really good at developing internal controls. So, you know, and, and by the way, let me, let me just say, although I was trained as a CPA and I started in the CPA business as a youngster, uh, I haven't uh, done CPA work in 30 years and I haven't had CPA clients in, in all those years. So uh, I'm not the one that does this. Although as the chairman of the board of uh, the Boys and Girls Club and, and, and some of the other many things that I've done, uh, of course, I have uh, strong financial skills and I can interface with these people. So I know a lot about this, but I, I don't do these kind of things myself. Well, you know, when you're talking about skills and, and, and rules, um, in your book, uh, number 27, you say uh, document your partnerships. Now, I, 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 I resonate with that because in all three of my books on strategic lines development, I pounded on that and I've continued over the years to pound on that with association executives actually today when they're creating alliances and I see a lot of problems. So, you know, what happens what are the things you've seen when there's no contract or a bad contract in various types of relationships? Well, you know, look, uh, everything in our society, uh, you only need a contract if something goes wrong. If everything goes perfect, you don't need anything. Sure. Uh, you only need life insurance, by the way, if you're, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to die sometime soon. Yeah. So uh, if you're not, then no need to buy life insurance. But none of us know when things are going to go, go good, go bad. So, so we have to buy these things, uh, you know, and in a certain way, a contract is a form of insurance. Okay. Uh, it's a way of, uh, of writing things down. It does a couple things. If things go wrong, then you've got documentation to get things to go your way or attorneys can kind of duke it out. And very, very few things ever go to trial because it's just so terribly expensive. And this is not coming from an attorney, it's coming from a businessman uh, who's been running uh, hedge funds and venture capital operations for a long, long time. So I've moved a lot of money around and I just understand a lot about how this whole process works. Uh, it's very rare to go the distance in a court of law. 
But what it does right up front is, Ed, let's say you and I are going to do something together. Sure. Let's write down exactly what we're going to do together. Let's be crystal clear so that there are no misunderstandings about what we're going to do together. Sure. You're going to do this job and I'm going to do this job and together we're going to work on these things and you're going to share these resources and I'm going to share those resources and we're going to do whatever, whatever. And that way, uh, there's no misunderstanding. Yeah. So six months from now, when I'm not pulling my weight and you say, hey, Joel, you're not pulling your weight. Well, you know, let's look at the paperwork and mm -hmm. see. Well, you were going to make five phone calls a day and you were going to do right. these things and you didn't do it. Okay, you're right. I didn't do it. I can do better now or, or whatever happens. Sure. Uh, if you don't have those things documented, forget about the fact that there's a contract. If you don't write down uh, what you're going to do, uh, you know, our memories fade, uh, circumstances change. We, we, we just, uh, you know what, that's not what I really meant. <laughs> and so those are all the reasons. Attorneys are very good at writing things down. They write them down in ways that, uh, you know, really capture what needs to happen uh, better than most of us can write. And that's their job is to write that down. So if you're going to do business with other people, be very, very careful. Uh, and certain kinds of partnerships, like the ones that, that I'm involved in, uh, there are active partnerships where, Ed, you and I are working on something together. And then there are passive ones where I say, Ed, you just give me the money, you sit back, and I'll do all the work. Yeah. That's a different kind of a partnership. That's not the same when you have a passive person, an active person. Uh, that's totally different. So most of the time when different organizations are working together, different associations work together on a partnership, that's more of a joint venture where they just kind of do a project together. And uh, you still, you got to write your stuff down, but, uh, you know, some of the other issues don't come up. You know, associations, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, uh, but I'm sure somebody could go look it up. But in the, and let's just, just to round it off, in the 1950s, um, associations got 95-ish percent of their revenue from dues. Today, um, associations are getting sometimes as low as 50% of their revenue from dues. So, so non-dues revenue is, is an important thing. Now, you have the distinction currently of being the uh, president of the Los Angeles chapter of the National Speaker Association. And you also have the distinction of making more money for that chapter in non-dues revenue than anybody in any of the chapters have done in the last several years. Um, what are your advice to uh, association executives out there that are saying, geez, you know, we, we, we've got to make some non-dues revenue to make this thing work. Yeah. What, what would you say to them? You know, I would, I would say that you have to think about uh, what you're doing, what you're offering and the value that you bring to the table. And, you know, here's the thing is that I would say most people who come to associations are going there to better themselves, to enhance their business, to enhance their personal uh, presence, whether it's a business organization or a personal one, whatever, whatever it is, they're there to make themselves better. And being attached to the organization, that, that makes them a little better. But if the organization can bring resources to people that the people don't have easy access to by themselves, sure. uh, then, then they will probably want to buy those resources. And it's entirely reasonable that the association effectively broker those resources to the members and make a little money on that. I mean, that's perfectly okay. The job of the association is to provide a platform for the members to get what they need to be better off. And, and that is a broad statement. And so the way I look at our organization is we need to bring many resources and, and, and a cafeteria of opportunities to people so that they can make themselves better off, be better at what it is that they want to do. Sure. And, and we can help them. And if we can help them, then we deserve a little bit more pay. Listen, when you go to Disneyland, you buy a ticket to admission, you, you ride some rides, and if you want food, you want souvenirs, uh, whatever the goodies are, you pay extra for that. Yeah. And people are okay with that. They're okay mm -hmm. with paying extra as long as it's enhancing uh, their experience and their life and their business and they're better off. And, and if they're better off, they're going to tell their friends, hey, you, don't want, you won't believe it. I'm better off. And I spent a bunch of money. And, and you know what? They didn't even charge enough because I got so much value. Sure. And that's where you want to be. You want to be leaving people with, I, I, they didn't even charge enough because I got so much value. I would have even paid more. Mm -hmm. How often do people say I would have paid more? Not, not often enough. So, you know, let, let's stay on this, uh, this, this theme a little bit. In uh, tip 57 of your book, you say, um, <laughs> sell the pain. And um, uh, I have my opinions on this, but I would sure like to hear your opinions on how associations and societies could do a much better job 
of selling the pain in order to allow them to, number one, recruit more members, number two, bring in more non-dues revenue. What can they do? Well, yeah, you know, listen, um, I, listen, I was trained as a, as a CPA, but I, I'm a salesman. I, I love to sell. I love to get people to say yes. Uh, now, I'm a very rational person. I don't jump up and down and scream and use weird tactics. I mean, I'm, I'm just rational. I, I just I, I talk. I have a lot of reasoning. But here's what I know. I know that, uh, you know, Americans, for the most part, and I can't speak to every other country, we take 10 times more painkillers than we take vitamins. And what that says to me is, don't sell happiness and kumbaya and friendship and, you know, all the other kinds of stuff. Sell problem solving. Sell uh, solutions uh, that people are looking for because they want to get out of their pain. Sure. Now, one of the other things that's important to understand is that businesses do not have problems. Businesses have expenses. That's it. You get sued, you throw a little money at it, the problem goes away. That, mm -hmm. that's, that's how simple it is. And you really have to think about business problems as expenses. Now, huh. people have problems. I mean, I mean, there, there are real problems in the world like, sure. uh, uh, divorces and, and illness and, and death. And uh, there are things that money can't solve and, and that's real. But in a business context, which is what we're talking about, you have to figure out what is bothering people? What is the problem that people have? And let's address those problems. Let's help people be good at those problems. I was on the phone this morning with a woman who, uh, she, she runs a construction company, a pretty big company in the Midwest. And she was telling me that uh, she's active in her uh, home builders association uh, where she, uh, where she has her company. Mm -hmm. and, and she was telling me what some of the value of that is, you know, that in 2006, seven, eight, the economy started to decline. Yeah. The business went from uh, $60 million in revenue uh, down to $12 million in revenue. I mean, a precipitous decline. And, you know, and, and they were thinking, well, maybe it's us, maybe it's our salespeople, mm -hmm. maybe it's this, maybe, but they went to the association, one of the regular meetings, mm -hmm. and everybody was having the same problem in 06 before the crash happened in 07, 08. Everybody was describing the same thing. The banks were tightening up, homeowners couldn't get uh, financing to do new remodels and things that they were working on. And so the association gave them sort of like a leading indicator, it gave them confirmation of, of something they were experiencing in their own business. So okay. the network, the camaraderie gave them confirmation. I mean, they were having pain and they got confirmation of that. Mm -hmm. That's something that an association needs to sell and they need to sell it hard, is the value of the network, the transfer information, the, uh, the sharing, you know, and, and the idea that by us sharing, everybody in our industry could be better off. Mm -hmm. Everyone in our industry uh, could know more about how we're doing so we all can be better at, uh, at succeeding in whatever it is that we're doing, even though we all do different things with different customers. Sure. So there are lots of things. Uh, start by writing a list of what are the problems, what are the pain points that people have, mm -hmm. and solve those problems. Okay. And, if you're, and if they're big problems, then they're going to pay you more. If you solve little problems, people are going to pay you less. Sure. So if you're having trouble uh, with your due structure, solve bigger problems. That's it. So you um, connecting to this and something you said earlier in your um, tip number 59 in your book, you said your value is all about perception uh, in your experience. Um, so, so we're saying, okay, we got to solve pain. We, we need to, you know, solve big pain to get big money. How do we um, help the members uh, to have a perception that that our association, number one, can solve the pain. Number two, is important enough to you know maintain their membership or to join. I mean, what what goes on in people's head, and, and what can we do to change people's perception of our organization and their perception of why they should be a member? Well, let's put it like this. First, uh, you know what I would say is what you don't want to do is you don't want to. Uh, make the perception be uh, inaccurate or false. Uh, so if you can solve a certain problem, solve the problem for some people and let the people who are members share what a great experience they had. And that's where things okay. like Facebook groups are very mm -hmm. effective. Let the members talk to each other. Um, you know, let the members tell each other. You know, here's the thing. A third party endorsement is very significant. Social proof is very significant. Sure. So rather than uh, the association director saying, 
look at how great we are. We did, did this thing. It would be so much more powerful for members to effectively write testimonials to say, you won't believe this. I went to this program that was put on by the association and I learned all this stuff. I'm so glad they turned me on to that experience. Mm -hmm. uh, what other experiences can they turn us on to? Yeah. And yeah. it's not the association's job necessarily to solve every problem, okay. but it needs to be a broker or a bridge to the solution. And that's how we need to think about ourselves in, in the association world is how can we be a bridge to a problem, to, to a solution to a problem. And if we can do that, there's money attached to that uh, mm -hmm. because number one, money always follows expertise. And if we're really experts, if the board of directs, if the board of directors are expert in these issues and the management of the association are expert in these issues, sure. they should really be able to provide leading edge ideas. And if they're not experts in these uh, things, then one of two things, one is uh, maybe we need to reorganize or two, maybe they need to convene panels who are experts. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be an expert to provide an expert solution because you can convine, convene panels of other people that can do a better job. No shame in not being an expert and knowing the answer. Shame on you though, if you don't convene a panel of experts who can help. Sure. So put your, your ego aside, get a panel of experts to, uh, mm -hmm. to the table to talk about how to solve mm -hmm. certain kinds of problems. Okay. Put the solution out there. And then members are saying, wow, this is fantastic. I got a mm -hmm. solution. Uh, that I really needed, I didn't know what to do, and they, these people were the bridge to the solution. Okay. And if the, if the association can be in between uh, the problem and the solution, members will fall in love and they will stay loyal for a long time. But we have to continue to reinvent ourselves as the world changes, and we have to continue to stay in front of those problems. Well, um, Leading, you know, that takes me right exactly in what a great segue um, into your tip number 20. You say, how badly do they need me? So I, I my translation and, and tell me if I got this right, is an, an association executive could and, you know, his or her board and <clears throat> their advisors could say, OK, how badly does the market need us? And if they're saying, well, the market doesn't really need us, <clears throat> maybe the association should close up or reevaluate who they are, what they do. But how can, how can they put themselves in, into a situation where the market really, really does need them? And well, I think, I think it starts with asking hard questions. And I have a whole section of the book on hard questions. And hard questions, you know, and, and remember, this book comes out of my background in venture capital. I've done dozens and dozens of deals. Sure. I've helped, uh, you know, hundreds of people understand how to put deals together. And so when I talk about this sort of thing, I mean, it's coming from my own personal experience. You have to ask very hard questions. You know, are we solving the problems of our constituents? Are we okay. addressing the needs yeah. of our constituents? And if they're not, uh, and if they're not capable of getting focused on what those needs are, then they better bring in some outside people, business consultants, okay. association consultants, whatever it is that they need to get focused on that. Okay. Because you have to remember that it's not good to disband because if the association has a history, then that association has networks of people mm -hmm. which are effectively like clients mm -hmm. uh, that are loyal to them. Mm -hmm. They may not be doing a good job right now of okay. addressing their needs, but they can fix that if they're smart. Okay. Uh, they don't want to abandon, though, uh, the network and the customer base that they've developed over time because they still have some goodwill left in their community, and they want to take advantage of that and leverage that as best they can. Just go get some help. So ask hard questions. What problems do we solve? What problems do our customers have? If the problems that you solve and the problems that your customers have are not the same, then you better bring them into alignment. Because, sure. uh, and by the way, the problems that your customers have are probably more important than the, than the things that you do. Sure. <laughs> If yeah. you want to keep them around. Yes. So get focused on that yeah. and, and solve those problems. And if you can't, convene a panel of people who can do it, start producing materials, start bringing in experts, bring in great speakers, bring in people who can do these things. And, you know, the solution is not hard. It's mm -hmm. a matter of doing it. What's hard, you know, here's the thing. The world is changing at a very, very fast pace. My mother-in-law, uh, she tries so hard with her iPhone and then she gets a uh, Spotify and she's got these wireless speakers and she tries so hard to learn all these different things. Mm -hmm. And it's not that she's a very intelligent woman and it's not the problem for her, which is the problem that businesses have 
is not that she can't learn how to use the new technologies. Mm -hmm. It's that she's having trouble unlearning cassette tape recorders <laughs> from the 1980s. She's having trouble <laughs> unlearning the VCR. She's having trouble unlearning all, well, well, you know, it sure. used to be like this. Okay, well, you know everything about that? It's gone, yeah. forget about it, don't, don't think about that anymore. It, it doesn't work like that now. Well, like, like I used to go to the store and buy a record, okay, and then it changed to go to the store and buy a CD. That was a pretty small change, not a big deal. But Spotify, there are no records, there are no CDs. Uh, you, you just rent the music month by month. If you stop paying, you don't have the music anymore. And if you do pay, you can get anything you want. That is, that is a very big and disruptive change in the marketplace. Sure. So the issue for a lot of executives, uh, whether they're board members or professional people who run these organizations, is unlearning what we've been doing for 30 years. And the more stuck you are uh, on, on a lot of this old stuff, and I'll tell you what, I see people and, and it just, it's, it's sort of like, you know what, Joel, I really don't want to uh, do all those things. I just kind of want to put my head down, have five or six more years pass, and then I'm going to retire. The world cannot wait for you for five or six years to put your head down and just pass over and hopefully you'll just be okay. Mm -hmm. The world does not have the patience to do that. And, and what will happen is that, uh, you know, relationships will start to unravel and, and all sorts of. Uh, things that you don't want to go your way will start to happen the way you don't want them. So you really have to kind of go with the tide. Whether you like it or not, all of these things are happening. Change, disruption. It's not even called change anymore. It's called disruption because it, it's so violent and, and it's mm -hmm. so difficult. And it's it, it's hard for us to keep track of it, but we have to. We have to, uh, in, we have to invite consultants and experts into our world who can help us to get in front of these issues. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you need detail people to go into the weeds. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need strategic advisors, uh, which is the sort of work that I do, uh, to help people kind of guide them at the 20 or 30,000 foot level to help them figure out where they need to go. Okay. I mean, that's, that's just, you know, uh, that's, if, that's how you figure out your value. And if you can't get in sync with the value that people need, uh, your, your, your history. So just, Taking on onto that, what might be the two or three biggest issues that association paid staff executives are having that 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 cause them to be in their own way? Well, number one is they love their own ideas, <laughs> okay. or, or 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 maybe they don't solicit enough outside ideas. Okay. Uh, maybe they're not feeling secure about their job. Maybe they're not feeling. Uh, secure uh, that that they're going to get support from their board of directors. Uh, maybe they haven't built really great, uh, you know, teams of people mm -hmm. inside their organization. I mean, it can be a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. and, and when I talk about associations, I mean, they're not really very different from the businesses that belong to those associations. Sure. The truth is that they are a reflection. Um, they tend to be smaller, though, much smaller, because their, uh, their revenue base is, is different. Uh, they're not, you know, they're not manufacturing things. And so even larger organizations are really relatively small, which makes them entrepreneurial mm -hmm. in a very interesting way is they're very entrepreneurial, but they're not always run in an entrepreneurial way. Oh, okay. they, they might be uh, there. They might be run in a very stiff and corporate way. Mm -hmm. when in fact, because they're relatively small, they could be very entrepreneurial and, and change course faster than larger organizations could. So there are certain advantages that associations have, which they probably leave on the table because they don't notice. Yeah, as you say that, you make me think of a, a particular large association in, in the country of association executives that um, uh, decided that they needed a 20 page report or process for innovation which I lovingly referred to as the roadblock to innovation. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, it, it's fascinating to me as, you, as you're talking about that. And I'm thinking about, you know, the different experiences I've had. Yeah, you know, um, there, there are a number of people that, that just let stuff get in their way. Um, okay, so we've got um, ego. Well, you know, there's always ego anywhere industry. So, you know, we, we know that's one. Um, unlearning, uh, fear of learning. We've got association executives that are in park for their two, three, four, five years until they can retire. And what, what do you, what would you tell if, 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 okay. So, so when you were on the boys and girls club 
board and you were the chair. Now, I know that you didn't have the situation, but if, if, if all of a sudden you realized that your executive director was on uh, a five-year park plan to, you know, just hang and then get their retirement, how would you deal with that? What would you well, do? For, first of all, um, it, you know, it, it, let's take a couple step backs, a couple steps back. Um, I was crystal clear with our board of directors that the job of the board of directors is governance and stewardship, that our job is to produce the resources that the executive director needs to mm -hmm. run the programs of the club, which is, mm -hmm. which was to take care of the children. We had about 7,000 children a year. We took care of it. This club, mm -hmm. it's a big club. And, and so our job was not to run the programs. Our job was not to meddle in the affairs of the director. I mean, really, I drew a really sharp line and gave her a lot of power and control. That also, on the other hand, meant that she had to produce. Sure. Because if she didn't produce, then we couldn't give her a lot of latitude. Right. But she was a great producer, and she really did a marvelous job uh, nationally. She okay. was well known as somebody who got a lot done. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it couldn't have happened with her that mm -hmm. uh, that she would put her head down because she was a tremendously committed person, and the nature of our relationship uh, it just it couldn't have worked that way. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, but I will tell you that if uh, if somebody uh, put their head down in, in my operation and said, I'm just going to coast for five years while the world goes by and hopefully no one's going to notice me, mm -hmm. uh, that doesn't work for me. Uh, you know, and just the nature of, of my style, I wouldn't be okay with that. I would, um, you know, I, 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 I would really try to provide some coaching and get people up to speed. Okay. Um, I'm a secure person. I, I don't worry a lot about what other people say and a lot of screaming and yelling and mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I, I'm not somebody who falls victim to a lot of these mm -hmm. kinds of uh, problems that other people okay. do. But the one thing that I, I would say is that uh, power comes from getting people to listen to you. It doesn't come from screaming and yelling and talking loud. Uh, it, it comes from producing good ideas, producing good partnerships with other people sure. and, and about being sincere. Mm -hmm. So if you sincerely want to make the place a successful place, wherever you are, whatever organization you're in, um, then provide real value to the organization, mm -hmm. uh, provide good ideas. And if you don't have all the best ideas, which you don't have to have, there's no, um, there's no copyright on having all the best ideas. Nobody owns the best ideas. Convene panels of people who can produce good ideas. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hey, listen. Uh, I didn't have all the ideas, but I could bring together people who could come up with the ideas. And you know what? Uh, that strengthened my chairmanship. I mean, because I was the one that brought the panel together. Sure. And and so executive directors need to feel strong in that. They don't have to come up with every great idea, mm -hmm. but they're responsible for getting great ideas on the table, Got however it. they have to do it. Sure. If they got to hire somebody to come up with some ideas, like advisors, or if they got to convene panels of uh, of their board members, or if they got to bring in outsiders and get committees, uh, there's lots of ways to do it. In fact, I happen to believe the more people you involve, the better. Mm -hmm. uh, disparate ideas are mm -hmm. always good. Uh, the discussion of those ideas is good, especially in large and disruptive uh, environments like ours. Uh, the only thing is that somebody has to be decisive, mm -hmm. pull the trigger and make some decisions because uh, going slow and being paralyzed and frozen is a recipe for disaster. So sure. uh, for all those reasons, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm absolutely in favor of, uh, you know, the, the person, whoever it is, the executive director or otherwise to uh, get the job done, however they have to do it. I mean, that's the bottom line. So if the chief staff executive, well, we're going to, we're going to take a, a little break here and do a 30 second shameless promotion for you. So if the chief staff executive is um, is wise enough to realize that they need some help and the chief staff executive likes what you have to say and wanted to talk to you about receiving help from you, how would they go about doing that? Well, they can reach me. Uh, my name is Joel Block, B-L-O-C-K, uh, Joel at Bullseye Cap and uh, bullseyecap.com is the website. So Great. Uh, Joel at bullseyecap.com. So, and you can put that on your website and share that information. but. You know, listen, I, I have uh, built and sold a number of companies. Uh, one of my companies I built and sold to a Fortune 500. So I've been in the entrepreneur and venture capital mm -hmm. business for, you know, most all of my career and uh, presently run a hedge fund. So, I mean, I've been around the block. I've been in the professional investing business. And one of the things that I will tell you is that people who are in the money business think about money differently than other people. 
And, uh, you know, I've been on the inside of that business. And so, uh, you know, our little slogan is really helping people profit from the inside, the inside insights, the inside uh, advice that, that we can provide. So uh, we, we see things in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't, uh, we're not wallflowers. Uh, you know, if you're looking for somebody who's going to say yes all the time, uh, you know, call somebody else. I, sure. I'm not rude, but at the same time, uh, I'm honest and mm -hmm. I will tell you what needs to be said mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't do, do you or me any good for me to waste time and, um, yeah. and tell you what. Oh, yeah. What, what Absolutely. So, so Joel, before we wrap this up, um, I, I just want to give you, because I asked a lot of questions, I'd like to give you the opportunity or just a little bit of freedom here to, you know, through our chat, uh, something may have come to your head that, you know, you're thinking, well, I'd surely like to talk about that if, if Ed brings it up. But in through the window of how you can help association executives here on this broadcast, I mean, is there something else that, that we've overlooked that you, that you think, you know, here's one more thing that, that, that these people that run associations need to know? Well, let's put, let's put it like this. Uh, you know, it has to do with adding value and what problems their constituents are having. Uh, one of the big con problems, you know, if, if they're different associations, of course, service different markets and everything. But yeah. let's say, for example, they're servicing uh, family-owned businesses or entrepreneurial type organizations. That could be car dealerships. Uh, it could mm -hmm. be uh, paint stores. It could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Um, you know, a lot of those people are thinking, how do we... Uh, transfer this business to the next generation? How do we sell it to other people because our kids don't want this business anymore? Sure. How do we prepare to sell? Mm -hmm. uh, those are the kinds of things that companies and associations need to be thinking about. And if the association can bring the content to the, to the members, and those are the things that they're concerned about, then they're going to be successful. That's just a single example of a problem that I know many, many companies are dealing with. Okay. We're dealing with uh, issues where where do they get more capital? How do they uh, how do they transfer the business? How do they uh, how do they work with their professional advisors? I mean, these are all things that organizations need to provide. Sure. For if they're smaller companies, if they're dealing with larger companies, then then they have to make a list of what those issues are. And you know what? Uh, these are issues that I've dealt with uh, hundreds of times, and would be happy to provide some guidance on. Great. Well, Joel Block, my buddy, my friend, um, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate you. I appreciate you sharing your ideas and your insight. And uh, to all the uh, association chief staff executives that, uh, that look at this and follow me on LinkedIn and stuff, you know, Joel's the real deal. If you need some help, um, feel comfortable, feel safe in giving Joel a call. Joel, thank you so much. And I'm going to, um, because this is raw and unedited, find the, <laughs> find the stop button. And uh, I'm going to say goodbye to everybody. Joel, say goodbye to everybody. Hey, Ed, thanks for having me. It was uh, my pleasure to be part of this. Okay.